you know, there's a certain emptiness that now permeates throughout this room now that my futon has transcended to a higher plane of existence. But hey, I'm finally looking at a Spider-Man game. Yeah, some of you are wondering when that date would arrive. I looked at Batman enough times, where's the Spider-Man love? Truth be told, I'm not what you would consider a humongous Spider-Man fan. I've been well familiar with the character for a very long time, but... You know, let's, let's start with the review proper. I've been meaning to play this game for months, but now that I got Resident Evil 2 Remake out of the way, now that I got Kingdom Hearts 3 out of the way, let's finally give Spider-Man some attention. So as I was saying, yeah, not entirely a big Spider-Man fan. I never read any of his comics bearing a few issues of Marvel Zombies, and even then he wasn't the focus of that. My earliest memories go back as far as the animated series that used to air on Fox Kids in the 90s, but I still didn't watch the show a whole lot. It didn't grab me the same way that Batman the Animated Series did, or shit, even Power Rangers, and that show was all kinds of bug nuts. I couldn't tell you why, it just didn't click with me. Still, despite the indifference, I didn't veer away from the web slinger either. I remember when we got our first computer back in 1996, it came with the Spider-Man Cartoon Maker Wii. You can draw, create movies with cheesy music, and glorified animated GIFs. It was terrible, but I did spend an unhealthy amount of time just fucking about with it. I'm getting all sorts of nostalgic looking at this. Whew, hard to believe that was close to 23 years ago. Besides that, I was also a pretty big fan of the Sam Raimi movies. Well, two of them. They haven't aged too gracefully, but I still think they're a good watch. The first one introduced me to Willem Dafoe, one of my favorite actors of all time. He's just so batshit insane in the first movie that he steals the whole show. Pity about the whole hand glider thing. Oh. The second movie I love just for the fight between Spider-Man and Doc Ock on top of the train alone. The third movie, eh, can't say I love it. I don't think it's a blight on humanity. I just think it went overboard in so many damn different directions. If I'm laughing at the film, it's for the wrong reasons. After this though, this is where I sort of stopped caring. I didn't watch any of the new cartoons. I saw Amazing Spider-Man in theaters once, didn't think much of it. And I didn't even bother seeing Amazing Spider-Man 2, though from what I hear, that was probably for the best. Starting with Captain America Civil War and Spider-Man Homecoming, I started taking a liking to the Spider-Dude once more because I thought these were great watches. Okay, Spider-Man! Go flip! Yeah! And yes, that also includes Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Oh my god, this is such a good movie. I, I mean, not just as a Spider-Man film, just the movie period. I saw it three times in theaters and loved it that much. Go watch it if you haven't seen it yet. My words can't do it justice. Now, if we're talking video games though, there's not much to discuss. The only Spider-Man games I ever played was Spider-Man Return of the Sinister Six for the NES, which could be best described as Spider-Man and the Sinister Dick Punch, given how effective low blows were to bosses in that game. I also played Separation Anxiety for the SNES over at SGB a few years back, and Anxiety is right. I can't think of anything else that would give me more anxiety than some random SNS robot kidnapping me and locking me in their sex dungeon and no you're not getting context for that besides those the only one i ever put any real time into was the video game adaptation of the first movie like i said i did enjoy the film so i went and got the game and it's all right i wouldn't recommend it now but it's still got a degree of personality and hey bruce campbell is the narrator for the tutorial segments and what's not to love about that if you want to throw some more goons around knock on the door by facing it and pressing the punch button i'm gonna grab a ham sandwich oh too much mustard I'm sure I can talk about this game some more should I ever get into a Spider-Man marathon. I get requests all the time to talk about Spider-Man games, mainly the ones released in the 2000s, so sure, we can do that one day, just not now. But yeah, that's my personal history with the Web Slinger, just to give you guys an idea where I stand on that. I was pretty excited for this game when it was first announced, not so much because of who was developing it. I didn't play much of Insomnia Games' other titles before this, if I'm being honest, but no, based on what was shown, it looked like they were giving us an Arkham game only with Spider-Man, and I was totally on board for that. And I just want to say now, if there are previous Spider-Man games that already sort of did this thing beforehand, I personally don't know about them, so my apologies if this seems like a fresh idea to me, but I assure you that ignorance stems from just the lack of playing other Spider-Man games. Whatever the case, it looked like we were getting Spider-Man Arkham City only with actual sunlight, something brighter, more colorful, with a lot more snark, and I wanted to start there. Spider-Man's not my favorite hero, but I adore him as a character. He is fun personified. After stopping crime, he takes a break to eat pizza. He takes the subway if he wants to fast travel to a certain location, all while chatting with the locals or listening to music or getting lost on his phone. You could roam around Times Square and say hello to people, give some folks some high fives, and he's got a mouth like you wouldn't believe. It's a fucking superpower, I swear to Christ. He knows exactly how to get under a bad guy's skin with his constant quips, snooty remarks, and... He never shuts up, but it's great seeing the bad guys get so annoyed by it. This game runs with that, and some of the best writing stems from the things said by Spider-Man in the middle of battle. If you ask me, some people don't talk enough. Think about who their mysterious overlord is. The person they're working for, that kind of thing. 
Yuri Lowenthal nails it perfectly with his performance as Peter Parker and his alter ego. Major kudos to him, this dude is Peter Parker. The acting is great throughout though, Laura Bailey as Mary Jane, Tara Platt as Yuri Watanabe, Nancy Lenari as Aunt May, just to name a few. They all put on great performances in a game that's also one of the best looking of this generation. Cutscenes look incredible, the models are on point, the framing is top notch, the lighting is superb, the sound design is sublime, and the fact that they're done in real time means any spider suit you wear will reflect on the current scene. The villains attempting something sneaky? Well this looks like a job for... The fantastic bagger. What is this costume? I love it. Putting on the Raimi costume makes you feel like I'm watching the fourth Raimi movie we never got though. This is just all scratching the surface. There's an ass load of costumes to unlock in this game. One of my favorites being the cell shaded retro costume. It sticks out for all the right reasons and I love it. The story here is nothing terribly complicated. Small spoiler warning, just a heads up. You can skip to here if you want to skip my plot summary. Spider-Man as a whole is something I would describe as tremendously safe in execution. It doesn't aim to break new ground in anything. When I call it Spider-Man Arkham City, I mean that in almost every sense of the word. And I should stress, that's not a bad thing. Our story begins with Spider-Man taking on Wilson Fisk and his gang. After a messy scuffle and a shitload of web, the Kingpin is apprehended and sent to jail. It's a bright day for New York City for all about 10 minutes. For shortly after Fisk's incarceration, a new mob of goons begin running amok. Known simply as the demons, led by this dude here named Mr. Negative, they plan on using this chemical concoction named Devil's Breath to infect the city and kill millions. Behind the scenes, Mr. Negative has quite the massive hate boner for Norman Osborn, the head of Oscorp, one of the largest corporations in New York City, as he blames him for making him the way he is and for being such a massive tool. So he wants to use Devil's Breath to sully his reputation and make him suffer, which is kind of overkill, but if you know your Spider-Man lore, he's not wrong about Norman being a dickwad, but infecting the whole city and trying to start a global epidemic is a little much and a little too close to the Lizard's plans in Amazing Spider-Man, which is just fucking absurd. But things get a little more complicated for Peter when it's revealed the one running everything behind the scenes is none other than Peter's former mentor, Dr. Otto Octavius. He too also has massive disdain for Norman Osborn, and really, you can see this coming a mile away. Anyone with even the slightest bit of Spider-Man knowledge knows that Otto Octavius eventually becomes Dr. Octopus, and the game isn't subtle at all with its foreshadowing, so even if you didn't know of Otto's eventual fate, it isn't terribly hard to predict what happens next. But pulling his resources together, Dr. Octopus releases some of Spider-Man's most notorious villains from prison and forms the Sinister Six for about two hours and then Spider-Man begins taking them all out. It's times like this where I wish I was more familiar with Spider-Man's gallery of rogues. I only know of a few, the Green Goblin because that's the most obvious one, Dr. Octopus, Mysterio, the Lizard. I know of the Sinister Six, but I know next to nothing about Rhino, Scorpion, Vulture, and Electro individually, and the game wastes no time getting me up to speed besides the bare necessities. Also, is there a difference between Electro and Shocker? They kinda got similar themes going on here. Is there something I'm missing here? I only know a Shocker because of Peter losing his goddamn mind in the animated series over him. There's also a few villains that are relegated to side missions. I like Tombstone, a near indestructible husky motherfucker that likes a good fight. I thought he was cool. However, never have I hated a character as much as I did with Screwball. I can't stand her, not just as a villain, but as a concept. She has peak internet culture that's been weaponized to the point of being obnoxious. I hate it. Likely the entire point with her, I'm aware, but my ears blood whenever she spoke. She's just the worst, and if I have to hear the word photobomb one more time, I'm gonna kick a fucking toddler. I thought the Sinister Six would be a plot element introduced much earlier in the story, and the whole game would be centered on taking each of them out in due time, but no, these guys are brought out in the last third of the game's plot, and Spider-Man makes short work of them. The boss fights are cool, no doubt, but things accelerate a little fast. Eventually, the Sinister Six is put behind bars once more and Spider-Man manages to put a stop to Dr. Octopus's plans, though not without some heartbreak because Peter truly did look up to Octavius before his experiments threw him off the deep end. As far as the whole plot goes, yeah, it's nothing complicated at all, but there's a whole bunch of nuances here I'm just skimming over. There is a ton of great character moments between Peter and the supporting cast, his conversations with MJ, the captain of the police, Aunt May, Miles Morales, need I mention his interactions with all the villains? These do great in making the basic plot feel like something more. Again, you can see everything coming a mile away, but the witty writing makes it all perfectly fine. A good mixture of lighthearted fun and gritty seriousness. I enjoyed this story, that's all I can ask for. It's not the end though, if you purchase the DLC up to this point, there's also the City That Never Sleeps arc split between three chapters. Each campaign runs about two and a half hours long if you're just playing the story mission, so if you ask me, they're worth the price tag. You know, they don't feel like your standard superfluous add-ons, no, they legitimately feel like a proper continuation of the main story with all the production values of the main content. We got the return of Black Cat who, okay, I don't know much of my Spider-Man lore, but is she supposed to be Catwoman? Is there more to her than that? Because that's all I can think about. I like her design more, but she is almost one-to-one -one Catwoman. You can tell me Hammerhead was a Dick Tracy villain and I totally buy it. I like the idea that the metal plate in his head makes him deadly in close quarters combat, but then by the third DLC chapter, he's fully decked out in a robotic body and I'm like, what the fuck? It's Big Riddle from the Batman Forever game and that's just a cardinal sin. You never remind me of Big Riddle. The DLC is a good book and to what's already a great game, but let's get into that. What do you do in Spider-Man? 
Well, as I said, Spider-Man is likely nothing you haven't experienced before. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, they always said, and Insomniac Games is hell-bent on not breaking anything. Although, I did want to start with a complaint. There's a lot Spider-Man can do in this game mechanically. He's got ground combos, air combos, he can grab objects and enemies with his web and swing them around, he can pull things towards him and punch the shit out of them, he can bounce off walls and get the jump on opponents, he can counterattack when his spider sense goes off, he can slide under goons to surprise people, he's got a surplus of gadgets that can incapacitate several enemies at once, from basic web traps, concussion blasts, electric webs that stun enemies... Ooh, that's a lot to take in, and the game tries to cram almost all of it down your throat within the first 15 to 20 minutes. I was overwhelmed with how much Spider-Man could do, and the game expected me to memorize it lickety split, which didn't happen. I got my ass kicked by the first couple of goons in the first boss fight against Kingpin. It felt like every button on the controller was important, and my hands became a pretzel trying to remember what did what, and that was just on combat. Spider-Man's maneuverability is second to none, but also requires a certain amount of dexterity to get right. A combination of shoulder button, the jump button, aiming your web at the right spots to get maximum height, wall crawling, zipping across tight gaps, you get the idea. Idea. And I wish the game took things a little slower at first so I can comfortably ease myself in. It's Spider-Man, I get that compared to Batman, there's a lot more this guy can do, but Spider-Man is Spider-Man. I'm just John, and for the first hour, I felt like Miles Morales getting a hang of his new spider powers. But you know, maybe that was the point? Maybe it was intentional to bombard you with all your tech from the get-go so that when you do eventually get the hang of it, it's more rewarding. Hey, it certainly is when you finally get it down. One of the best things about this game from beginning to end is just web slinging across the city. Yeah, I'm not kidding. It was euphoric traveling across New York. Even when the next destination was several city blocks away, I didn't care because that meant I could spend more time trying to see how fast I could pick up the speed, how far I could drop before saving myself with a last minute web swing, although this game doesn't have fall damage whatsoever, so you can free fall off the adventure tower and be no worse for where when you land. Climbing up skyscrapers, taking pictures of landmarks in the middle of a swing, diving headfirst into a crime. You're Spider-Man. There's no better way of putting it. And as the friendly neighborhood web slinger, you travel across a good part of New York City and do whatever a Spider-Man does. A lot of it is combat focused. You can stop crimes in progress, whether it be car chases, turf wars against criminals in the police, bank robberies, hostage situations. There's also criminal bases you can take down. These often involve dealing with a surplus of enemies in hand-to-hand -hand combat or stealth sections that require you to take out threats quietly. These are some of my favorite missions to do because there was nothing more satisfying than luring a crook away from the crowd and then webbing them up to subtract one from the total count. I just hope there's air holes in these traps. I swear sometimes leading these guys to a painful death via asphyxiation. Some things require a little more finesse, like the time challenges given to you by this dude named Taskmaster. I really like how they handle this guy too. After completing a handful of his challenges, he just pops in with no warning and forces you into a fight to test your abilities, and he kicked the living shit out of me. But that's cool, that just made me want to complete his challenges and fight the dude in retaliation. Nobody kicks Spider-Man off the roof and gets away with it. Outside of combat, there's a crap load of other things you can do just by swinging around. You can find old backpacks that contain random items that Spider-Man comments on, leading to some nice world building and some good humor. You can uncover more of the map by heading to these towers on top of police stations and reconfiguring their signals. There's these research stations that give you tokens for extra unlockables. You can snap photos of famous landmarks and earn extra experience points. This game is exploding with what I consider the standard busy work. The kind of stuff that isn't required to complete the story, but is there to help pad out the complete experience. It should only take you a couple of days to finish the story if you just focus on the main missions. Everything else is up to your discretion, and that's fine. The campaign is still a healthy 14 to 16 hours without doing any side missions, and I'd rather something like pigeon hunting to be completely optional because what the hell am I doing here? I'm chasing pigeons. Is this something Peter Parker does a lot in the comics? No matter what you do, there's always incentive. From experience, you can earn to acquire skill points that you can use to unlock new abilities or upgrades to your gadgets. And the more side stuff you complete, the more tokens you can earn to help unlock extra costumes that also come with their own bonus abilities. Personally, I love the Spider Bro ability that came with the Stark suit. Once the meter filled up, I got this cool little spider drone that tastes the fuck out of everyone that was close by. Really handy against those chunky fellows that can take extra punishment, although once you upgrade your abilities enough, there's like 50 ways to deal with enemies in Spider Man, and that kind of versatility goes a long way. In fact, for as much as I hated Screwball, her missions where you're limited to using certain combinations of gadgets really highlighted the kind of unique and satisfying ways you can take care of mobs en masse. So you don't just have to, you know, air combo everything until the cows come home. Still, got a couple of things that didn't mesh well with me though. There's several instances between cutscenes where you're just waiting for the next mission objective to appear, often signified by a phone call with whoever's relevant at the time. This isn't too bothersome since I do enjoy web slinging so much, but it did feel odd waiting for things to progress. I love how J. Jonah Jameson is now a podcaster that constantly shits on Spider-Man and whatever is happening at the moment, and I love listening to him ramble, but these segments are given to us in real time, and if I don't want to interrupt these with a story cutscene, you know, because I'm on my way to the next objective, I have to slow things down until the session stops. This can also apply to those small dialogue exchanges between Spider-Man and company that might happen after getting the next 
next objective. It's usually flavor text, but they can also be fun character exchanges. I can't listen to them all though without slowing down. I think they slightly underestimated just how fast you can get to your next destination and figured you had more than enough time to listen in on the conversation, which wasn't always the case. There's a couple of times where you switch to Mary Jane or Miles for some story driven sections. Usually it's some sort of stealth section or investigation segment and they just shit all over the pace. Individually, they're just fine, but compared to the sheer intensity of things you do as Spider-Man, I think it clashes. Now I love me some good stealth gameplay, but this is a little limiting for my liking. At least with MJ, she gets a stun gun later and knocking out unsuspecting thugs is pretty cathartic. Miles doesn't really get something like that. He just hacks things from a distance to cause distractions. It doesn't have the same impact. But it's not as if Spider-Man doesn't have his oddball moments as well. Sometimes the game likes to emphasize Peter Parker instead of Spider-Man, and that's cool. I appreciate the dichotomy. When he's not kicking ass, he's a good-natured scientist with a genius-level intellect. I get it. But most of Peter Parker's gameplay consists of him doing these wiring puzzles and line-matching minigames. You get experience points and tokens for completing these, so at the end of it, it's Spider-Man that reaps the rewards. And they're not terribly complicated or overly long for that matter, but again, they clash so hard with everything else you do as the guy. However, they only make up small moments in what's otherwise a remarkably solid action adventure game. Yeah, it's nothing the Arkham games haven't done already. This is simply Spider-Man's <clears throat> swing at the formula. <laughs> but you know what? Sure. Who cares? It's nothing new, but it does what it does well. Only instead of the Cape Crusader, you're the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man who can high-five the locals. The story is run of the mill, and yet it's easy to get into. The main campaign is filled with a ton of things to do with a good dose of variety to keep things from getting monotonous. And I don't mean the MJ and Miles stuff I mentioned earlier. I'm talking strictly the Spider-Man stuff. There's a lot of different things you do with him and him alone, and that's great. The humongous amount of costumes and gadgets to unlock give all the side stuff added purpose besides giving you a higher completion rating, and the game is just bursting at the seams with personality and humor. I still don't think I'll pick up a Spider-Man comic after playing this, but I love Spider-Man in this regardless. It's great to say that the best thing about Spider-Man is Spider-Man. Insomniac Games did good, so you should consider picking it up. It is a PS4 exclusive, just a heads up, so hopefully you got one if you want to take a shot. Now then, I think it's finally time we begin another marathon. It's been a while since I gave this series a revisit. I want to say six, seven years, but around there. But the adventure continues next time. Thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care. Hey, before I end this video, I want to thank you folks for helping me recently break 350,000 subs. It's a year-end goal for me to break 400,000, and you guys have been doing a magnificent job showing your love and support by watching the video, sharing them with your peers. I, I can't thank you enough for that, so again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for helping this channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time.